being in the Navy, I have to start off with making at least a little comment about water and its importance because water is a universal solvent in your chemistry class. Well, to a surgeon, we also have a universal solvent, solvents, and those are compassion and empathy because they dissolve away barriers. Barriers in my profession can be life-threatening. Barriers such as language, race, religion, morals, all of that all come together. They must come down. Compassion and empathy dissolve that away. And that allows for a very, very remarkable bond, a patient-surgeon bond that is just remarkable. Combine that with surgeries, and my surgeries become magical. They transform lives, as my stories will tell you. My stories will be set aboard a floating vessel. The Navy has two of these, and they are national treasures. These national treasures are very large, they're white, and they have red crosses painted on them. They are our hospital ships. And whether they go out for humanitarian missions or disaster relief missions, they, when they deploy, they become the human touch of America. It is felt everywhere. They are also known as America's white angels. But I'm not here to talk to you about the white ships. I'm talking to you here today about an old-fashioned country doctor approach to being a surgeon, where I do not look at my patients as a simple recipient of my knife and saw, but I see them as people, as people that earn kindness and compassion just simply because they're fellow human beings in a time of need. In a country that once was our enemy, on the hospital ship USNS uh, Mercy, in Southeast Asia, I met a young pretty girl, a teen. Ho Yen was her name with her mom. And when she was a young child, she had a broken elbow. And that broken elbow did not heal properly. She had several surgeries. They went bad. The deformity went from her elbow all the way up to her wrist and created a deformity such as this. This in the developing country is a harbinger of what is known as cerebral palsy. It's not true, but that's what they think. And they also believe something else, that cerebral palsy is contagious. Therefore, this pretty young girl was shunned, she was ridiculed, she could not go to school, and she did not even have one friend. She spoke only broken English, but her eyes, those sorrowful eyes, they fluently spoke, help, help me. I struggled for days on how to fix this. I didn't have a good answer. Those eyes kept haunting me. Hours before her surgery, in my sleep I awoke, recognizing I got it. Excited that morning, I talked to my foreign colleagues, told them my plan, expecting to see some smiles, and I got frowns. No, too complex. It'll fail. Do minimum. Do the minimum. What O Yen wanted, what she craved, what she had to have, was not just a better elbow. She also had to have a normal wrist and rid herself of that stigma incorrectly placed on her. For O Yen and I, we had a bond. I proceeded with my plan alone. At the time of discharge, I met them at the gangplank. I talked to her mom. I said, what do you think? She had tears in her eyes. And she said, you do professional job. Been a surgeon a long time. 
Never before, never since have I ever been told that I've done a professional job as a surgeon. I'll never forget those words. I will also never forget what Oyen told me when I asked her what she thought. Those now bright eyes, full of tears, one streaming down the side of her face, with a almost confident smile, she said, maybe now, friends. I looked at mom, her tears were pouring. She said very quietly, maybe now, husband. Half a world around, two years later, on another hospital ship, the USNS Comfort, I was in Haiti. I saw patients who were severely injured by the hundreds. I listened to all their stories. It gave me fuel to go on to the next, to the next, to the next. There seemed to be no end. But I will tell you of only two stories. Put yourself in Vanya's place, a teenage girl sitting down at the supper table. You hear a rumble, you feel the earth vibrate, and then before your very eyes, you see your father crushed to death. You see your mother, your brother, your sister, pinned under the rubble with lethal injuries. And you watch, you hear them die over hours and days. That earthquake was as indiscriminate and diabolical as it was destructive. Joel, 28-year-old Mason, made his, hand, made his living with his hands, much like I do. He had a very, very bad injury to his elbow. Exposed bone, elbow was basically gone. But his hand worked. I had lots of opportunity to talk with him, to share stories, to learn more about him, as I did most all of my patients. You see, Joel, he had a job. He had a family. He has kids. He has an aspiration for those children. But he also needed to have an amputation. The indications were clear. No question. It needed to come off. But you see, he didn't want that. As a matter of fact, every time somebody with a white coat walked by on that ship, he would hold his hand up, say, see, it, it worked, it worked, it worked. The morning of his surgery, he was creating quite a ruckus. He would not sign his operative consent. He kept saying, it works, it works, do not cut it off, do not, I need it. He was searching desperately, searching, searching, searching. And then he found what he was looking for. And he waved to me with his fingers. As I approached, I saw his fear. It was palpable. I saw the sweat on his forehead, under his arms. His hands, his fingers were trembling with fear. He knew what was coming on. I walked over to him, put my hand on his soil dressings, and looked at him and said, I understand. You see, Joel and I, those towers and hours of talking, we had a bond. He signed that surgical consent. I then turned and walked away. In the operating room, my colleague, Dr. Rob Rulin, and I, we looked at his elbow. We took the dressings down and looked at it, and it, it was bad. It was real bad. It needed to come off. But we looked at each other and said, we have to try everything, anything. We have to. And we did. We connected the humerus to the radius and ulnar. We connected these bones directly, bypassing the elbow joint. No, he would never, ever have again the use of his elbow, but he would have the use of his hands. 
when he awoke from anesthesia. The first thing he did was look beyond his now clean white dressing on his elbow, down at his hand. He stared at it. It moved. It works! It works! It is here. It's alive. Thank you, God. What gave Oyen the opportunity for a new life? What gave Joel the dreams, small and meager as they may be, for someone trapped in the countries, in the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere? It wasn't the surgery. No. It was the surgery combined with a forged of compassion and empathy. That created a bond a very, very firm bond. That is the bond that keeps me excited about being an orthopedic surgeon each and every day. I will tell you one more quick story, a little bit of a different one, but the power of the human spirit and how it can change the outcomes of medicine. It's a story of a little boy's love of his daddy that was unconditional and never never wavered. I was on call on a long holiday weekend. One of my patients was a young Marine. His legs were blown off, his arm badly mangled, and he laid in his bed day after day after day, staring up at the ceiling. His body was crisscrossed with wires with lines going to little white boxes with LEDs brightly flashing the hum of which almost seemed to override the sound of his pulse. His room was decorated. On a wall, on another wall, there were colorful thank you notes from unknown school children from across the country, and they, they thanked him for his service. On another wall over here, there were pictures of a happier time, pictures of him looking sharp in his marine dress uniform. Pictures of him in his camouflage on the desert, playing with his kids, and a picture with his wife at his last anniversary. His life was all across the room, but all he did was stare at that white, bare ceiling. Why are we doing this? Why are we keeping him alive when his body can no longer? Are we merely prolonging his death? Are we depriving this once, this once proud Marine of his final dignity? I begin to question. And then it happened. The last day of rounding. It was his room. I just wanted to, to walk in very quickly, do what I had to do, and back out and leave because it had been a long weekend. I didn't know how much more I could absorb. I walked in. His wife was there. That was good. Small talk with her. It would, well, it would help me from having to look at the obvious because all he does is look at the ceiling. But I also noticed something different. I noticed his young son there drinking a large carton of milk. Odd. I commented to his mom. He's drinking milk in this day of sugar drinks, somewhat unusual. He said, she said, that's his thing. Now that he's seen his father's condition, that's what he does. The little lad put down his carton of milk, milk mustache still dripping down. He said, I'm going to drink all my milk, be big and strong and like a Marine. And one day, I want to be just like my dad. And I want to. Give him one of his, one of my legs. 
so that we can be the same. It struck. It hit. It hit hard. I turned to hide that he emotionally, this little boy emotionally caught me off guard. But as luck would have it, or fate, I turned and my eyes caught his father. His father gently turned his head. His eyes now focused on his young boy. This now proud Marine offered a small smile and he raised very slowly his only working extremity and gave a thumbs up. I questioned what his little boy never did. And I was wrong. 